New York, the setting for the world premiere of the long-awaited new J.K. Rowling movie, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. It's been five years since the last Harry Potter movie, the final instalment of one of the most successful franchises in cinema history. And now she's gone and added a whole new dimension to the wizarding world. The combination of the 1920s and Fantastic Beasts is kind of irresistible even before you get to the story. If you haven't seen the Potter films, it doesn't matter. It stands alone as its own thing. It's been so much fun. I really hope they enjoy it. Are you looking forward to this movie? Definitely! Yay. But where did Fantastic Beasts come from? I'm going on a journey behind the scenes of the new film with exclusive access to the stars. Her imagination is so insane and wonderful. I'll be exploring why the Wizarding World connects so strongly with fans around the globe. It makes me feel more powerful. And I'll be looking into the magical mind of JK Rowling herself. Wait, Warwick, something's <laughs> for me. It's almost 20 years since the first Harry Potter book was published, and almost 500 million copies and eight blockbusting films later, J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World has become a global phenomenon. I was lucky enough to be in the first Harry Potter film when I was cast as Professor Phileas Flitwick. Don't forget the nice wrist movement we've been practicing. Mm. The swish and flick, everyone. Wish and flick. That movie was based on J.K. Rowling's first Harry Potter novel, The Philosopher's Stone, which also holds a clue to the origin of Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. So, my first stop is at Bernard Shapiro's bookshop in central London, who found a rare first edition hardback to show me, one of only 500 ever printed. How much is this first edition of Harry Potter worth? you would probably be looking to spend between 30 and 35,000 pounds. That's unbelievable. It really is super, super rare. Now I'm looking into the genesis of Fantastic Beasts. There was mention of Fantastic Beasts in here, wasn't there? You can see here, Hogwarts, School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Things you need, uniform, and then we go on to set books. 1,000 magical herbs and fungi, magical drafts and potions. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them by Newt Scamander. Although Newt Scamander was never mentioned again in any of the other Harry Potter novels, in 2001, J.K. Rowling decided to publish a small textbook called Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them for the charity Comic Relief. It was a textbook that Harry Potter used at school. During the writing of that textbook, I became quite interested in the ostensible author, Newt Scamander. Newton, Newt, uh, Artemis Fido Scamander, was born in 1897. His interest in fabulous beasts was encouraged by his mother, who was an enthusiastic breeder of fancy hippogriffs. So basically, what is this book all about? It lists 75 magical beasts that exist in the wizarding world. Isn't he beautiful? <laughs> Say hello to Buckbeak. Hagrid, exactly what is that? That run is a hippogriff. When I wrote the textbook from within Harry's World that I did for Comet Relief, I had ideas around the issue of Fantastic Beasts that went beyond the, the demands of writing that particular book. At Hogwarts, there's a forest where many of them dwell. But what happens in the wider world? They can't hide themselves. They don't understand they're supposed to hide. So I sat down and I started writing what I saw as Newt's story, and then I became quite interested. And then I thought, well, then, of course, that would be happening, wouldn't it? And then I know Newt did that. J.K. Rowling decided to write her new magical story directly for the screen. Set 70 years before Harry Potter, it stars Eddie Redmayne as a young British wizard, Newt Scamander, who arrives in 1920s New York with a collection of fantastic beasts concealed in a magic case. British, huh? Yes. First trip to New York? Yes. Anything edible in there? No. 
Newt's been traveling the world studying magical creatures. He can't resist if he finds something that's injured or endangered, taking it with him. So what looks like a case, you open it up and there's something in there that can blow the wizarding world sky high. Welcome to New York. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is being created here at Warner Brothers Studios Leavesden, where the Harry Potter movies were also made. Like the put-upon orphan, Harry, J.K. Rowling's new hero, Newt Scamander, is another outsider, and I caught up with Eddie Redmayne during a break in filming to find out more about him. Tell me a little bit about Newt's character. Who is this guy? Who is this enigmatic man? Um, <laughs> he is, Newt Scamander is a magizoologist by trade. He is, um, he's basically spent a year in the field and has been, in, in the magical world, beasts are a giveaway that magic exists. So uh, they're not particularly, they're, they're sort of looked down on by um, wizards. Newt is this oddball who managed to get himself expelled from Hogwarts. He wants people to understand how remarkable these creatures are. So over time, this case has become effectively a safari park for endangered species. Newt has a deep love of animals and they need the, the, the space to roam. And so what's wonderful is all within this, within this case, there is a great, all these different landscapes and terrains that kind of burst off into the distance. But so it is bigger than we can even imagine here. Exactly, yes. <laughs> they basically go on for miles. The set we're on is the vast magical interior of Newt's suitcase, where he keeps his fantastic beasts. Inside, he feeds and nurtures them, safe from the dangers of the outside world. Do you want them? Oh, oh wow, yeah, sure. Okay. Ha! Ah. <laughs> hey. So did you meet J.K. Rowling before you started? And I what did. advice did she give you? I had so many questions um, to ask her. Mm. And so I think my, I was probably quite rude and, and my pleasantries lasted about 30 seconds and then I was straight into, so mute, where exactly? And we just had the most amazing conversation for about an hour. I had a really clear idea of who he was. Um, slightly awkward in his own skin, when, it, when in human company. I thought of those sort of 19th century explorers at home out in the savannah, but perhaps a bit rough around the edges in a drawing room. And Eddie's just great at doing that. What was the key thing she said to you that really gave you his character in a nutshell? Oh, it was interesting. Words? He's much better at interacting with animals than he is with humans. And kind of what he, what he learns in this film is about connecting with people. I see. <laughs> oh, sorry, no, don't pet them. You, um, learn to defend themselves early. See, their shells are made of silver, so they're incredibly valuable. OK. He's most comfortable in the natural world, but Newt has an understanding of people who may be stigmatised or othered. That's at the heart of most of what I write, and it's certainly at the heart of this movie. I've always liked the fact that J.K. Rowling writes about outsiders. Being three foot six, I know what it feels like, not quite fitting in which is why, perhaps, I've always felt at home in the wizarding world. I've appeared in all eight Harry Potter films since the first one came out in 2001. Mr. Harry Potter wishes to make a withdrawal. As well as Professor Flitwick, I played the goblin bank teller in Gringotts Bank. And does Mr. Harry Potter have his key? Oh, wait a minute. Got it here somewhere. The producer who brought the Philosopher's Stone and all the other Harry Potter books to the big screen was David Heyman. And now he's producing Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. Our lead character in Fantastic Beasts is Newt. How different is kind of his wizarding world to the world that we found Harry in? It's New York 1926, so that's different. But a good portion of the story does take place in the magical in, in her wizarding world, the magical universe. There's a lot more tension, isn't there, between the, the, the kind of the wizarding world and the, and the nomad world in this film. Unlike in England, where the two worlds seem to exist harmoniously, in America, this isn't the case. At least tell me you took care of the nomad. The what? The nomad. No magic. They're not a wizard. Uh, 
Sorry, we call them muggles. You wiped his memory, right? Joe Rowling herself has written the screenplay. Has that been a different experience? Oh my goodness, and how? I mean, in a way, having a book was, was a wonderful crutch. It was something that we could lean on. But at the same time, that's a real burden because the fans were aware of every little thing that wasn't there. And in this, we have had none of that. But we have had the incredible imagination that Joe brings to it. Three, two, one, go! Three! <laughs> We get to visit not the Ministry of Magic, but the American equivalent, Makusa. The world is so richly conceived, it doesn't feel like happenstance. Joe has thought it through in such a deep and profound way. Alongside Eddie Redmayne, the co-stars of this new movie are the Fantastic Beasts themselves. So, how do you create a magical creature that only exists in J.K. Rowling's imagination? Well, that's what I'm going to find out next. Niffler. The Niffler is a British beast. Fluffy, black, and long snouted, this burrowing creature has a predilection for anything glittery. Really? J.K. Rowling's original textbook, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, describes a host of magical creatures, several of which, like the Niffler, appear in the new film. If you don't love the Niffler, there's something wrong with you. People have met Nifflers in the Potter books. They're thieves, very adorable thieves, and create mayhem. The Niffler is one of many magical creatures to escape from Newt's yeah. case into the middle of Manhattan. Look. The challenge of bringing the fantastic beast to the screen has been taken on by a huge visual effects team led by Tim Burke, who worked on many of the Harry Potter films, now joined by Christian Manns. Now this guy on the screen here, I believe is a Niffler. So we didn't see one of those in the Harry Potter films, but we, no, we heard the about them. We heard about them in the books, but never made the movies. So where did you start? We referenced lots of animals. We referenced platypuses, moles. This was one of the first designs, and they flew with all his feathers. Well, that's brilliant. And a lot of it was just the mechanics. How would he grab stuff, steal stuff? They started doing drawings really, really early on, and so I've seen all of those creatures from pencil sketch up to model, up to computer, quite crude 3D animation, and then you see the real thing, and it's, I mean, they're real. 
It's extraordinary. To what extent did you use this book as a basis for the creation of the beasts? It was the Bible from which we mm. took all the descriptions and then they evolved from that point onwards. But we were mm. faithful to what Joe had originally written and described. Because there's some wonderful little illustrations here as well, aren't there, in the margins? There's a bird called a frupa. I'd done a little sketch in the original book and they just took that and, and, and made it obviously a million times better. <laughs> but it's based on my original um, sketch. The whooper is an African bird with extremely vivid plumage. Whoopers may be orange, pink, lime green, or yellow. We loved the kind of like the, the teardrop shape. And then Paul Catlin, one of our concept artists, come and came up with this beautiful piece of artwork based upon that. I mean, look, compare those two together. It's exactly the same. So we created the whooper. I mean, looking at him there, he looks like a creature we might see on Earth. If a muggle saw one of these creatures in real life, you'd think it was just a normal animal. They had to feel like they existed in the real world, otherwise, fundamentally, we would have failed. Many of the beasts J.K. Rowling has dreamt up for this new film weren't in her original textbook and aren't quite as cute and cuddly, like the aptly named Swooping Evil. In the script, it was described like a cocoon that Newt throws and then it turns into a bat-like creature. Eventually, what we came up with was this guy here, <laughs> Swooping Evil. The skull, we did as a head, and he's kind of got a proboscis that kind of comes out of his um, mouth like a butterfly and he kind of sucks memories out of people's ears. So this is thrown and as it's thrown, that hatches out. Yeah, like a pop-up tent, basically. <laughs> it kind of like yeah. unfurls itself. Originally, this scene took place in the corridor and we wanted to kind of illustrate what would happen with this thing flying around and how you could block the scene, really. So in the end, when you see this beat happen in the film, it's in a much bigger space. Leave his friends, come on. Come on. Sweeping evil. Well, I love it. <laughs> Everything I've ever worked with that Joe's written has really allowed us to be as creative as we possibly can. Mm. She's got such a fantastic imagination. And for us, it's an absolute joy because what, what you really want to do is work off great material. It's mind blowing to see how much work has gone into creating these beasts. I think it's all driven by J.K. Rowling's meticulous attention to detail, and I'm not the only one. The thing that I love is that her imagination is so insane and wonderful and kind of um, extreme in, in, in its complexity, and yet it's all bound together in a fully comprehensive world which you can believe in. And I suppose that's kind of one of the things that I loved in the Potter films, and I, and I, and I love in what she's done with Fantastic Beasts. As well as your magical case, yeah. you also, I'm sure, have a wand, do you? That's true, yes. I do. I, and I, I've got to say, even at the audition stage, the second that you were given a wand to choose from, I think my sort of inner 10-year-old, like, had a kind of mini heart attack, <laughs> so excited. Uh, but there's, a, there's an entire wand department here. I don't know if they had it on yeah, Potter, absolutely, and they, yeah. they design, and they come and talk to you about your character and what sort of wand your character would have. So. We decided that Newt would have quite a simple, whittled wood. Yes. A bit of, a bit of sort of mother and pearl shell stuff going on, but no leather, no, uh, no, no sort of products, animal products, basically. exactly, yes. Hey, Mr. English guy, I think your egg is hatching. You know, it's really nice to have the freedom to kind of explore the studios here. Uh, and I'm currently on the lookout for the prop store, which I think is this building here, Workshop 9. So uh, very exciting. I'm going to check it out.
Newt Scamander's wand is one of the many props in the new film, crafted by Pierre Bohanna and his team. I know Pierre well from my Harry Potter days. It's been a while. He and his team crafted all the original wands and props we worked with. Curious. Very curious. What would a, a magical film be without wands? And these look actually quite a bit more exciting than some of the ones we had on Harry Potter. Sometimes the plainer the wand, the better, you know? That's really quite an interesting one. It's to do with character, isn't it? It's to do with to do with the character of the actor. I mean, there you go, that's news. And also with wands, the other thing we have to think about, weirdly enough, is safety, because the wooden sticks themselves are actually, uh, you know, if you fall on them, they're quite dangerous. So yeah. we, often what we do is we have here reversions, which you're looking at now, which are close camera work, but then we do rubberized ones as well. Some of the props Pierre's built here are unlike anything we had on the Potter movies. What on earth is that? What on earth is that? That's a wand polishing machine. A wand polishing machine? Yeah. See, I used to have to polish my own wand. There's normally an elf sitting on here. Is there? So he sits in there and he's got a little tread plate there that he'll, he pushes up and down. Oh, look, yes. When he presses that down... That's brilliant. OK. So I just sort of place the wand in... Polishes away and slightly tickles, which is quite nice. Yeah, in you go. <laughs> like a and very look... gentle car wash. But look at that, a pristinely, yeah, a nice and shiny. Wand. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> the wand polishing machine in the new film is based at Makusa, the magical congress of the United States of America. It was inspired by the real life 1920s Woolworth building in New York. The sets for the new movie are even more ambitious than the ones I worked on in the Potter films. And we certainly never had to recreate a whole city. That was always going to be the greatest challenge for the team behind Fantastic Beasts, and I'm going to find out how they did it. Much of the action in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them takes place on the streets of 1920s New York. And as I wander around this extraordinary set, the largest ever built specially for the Wizarding World, I can't help but think that all this is only here because over 20 years ago, an unknown author began to write a story about a boy wizard. I mean, I wonder what it's like to be J.K. Rowling. All those years ago, something fired off in her brain and here we are, look what she created. Walking in and knowing I was about to see sets for the new movies was so exciting. We turned around a corner and I saw New York. And I had this complete, all over cold feeling of, oh my God, 
I remembered where I was and I had that idea. It's unbelievable. It's taken over 300 builders and craftsmen four months to construct this stunningly accurate recreation of 1920s New York, a few miles outside Watford. The production designer behind this set is the same man who created Hogwarts Castle here at Leavesden and designed all eight Harry Potter movies, the Oscar-winning and quietly brilliant Stuart Craig. This is City Hall subway station. It is an actual station which New Yorkers will be familiar with. I've been on a lot of sets, but this is, this is impressive. This really is impressive. I'm half expecting to hear a train coming. You know, it's, it's brilliant. Now, tell me a little bit about where you started with the Harry Potter universe. So the novels were very, very detailed and detailed in, in a visual sense. So that was extremely helpful. J.K. Rowling is also very generous and very wise, I think, in that she allowed the films to be their own thing. So the sets that we built they were inspired by that thought that we should be immersed in great antiquity. And the Gothic style seemed appropriate to magic somehow. It's not real, the ceiling. It's just bewitched to look like the night sky. In working on Fantastic Beasts, of course, you only had a screenplay written by J.K. Rowling. You didn't have the background of the novels and, and a script to work from. Did that make it a different experience for you? Did you approach it differently? It was established on Potter that the world should appear familiar, and if the magic grows out of that seemingly real place, then it's all the more effective. That philosophy of uh, everything seeming to be real and the architecture very solid, very credible, was learned on Harry Potter and carried through to Fantastic Beasts. I've arranged to meet another star of Fantastic Beasts and lifelong Harry Potter fan, Ezra Miller. Out of the way, more. We're meeting back on the New York street set where many of his scenes take place. Ezra plays another outsider, the mysterious Credence Barebone. So you grew up watching the Harry Potter films, didn't you? I'm actually a fanatic. And little did you know, <laughs> at the tender age of five, that you would one day be part of that world. I think we all remember the sensation of uh, kids who are really into Harry Potter, of not getting the Hogwarts letter, age 11. You <laughs> wait, you're like, come on, come on, I know I've got it. I know I've got the goods, Dumbledore. <laughs> Where are you at? And it just, it doesn't show. Uh, but then mine was just a little delayed, apparently. What have you noticed about uh, the connections between Harry Potter and, and the world of Fantastic Beasts? Have you seen those? Mm, I think the, the savvy Harry Potter fan will note a lot of connections. It seems like uh, Jackie Rowling has given us this gift of opening another window into the wizarding world. Instead of being in sort of an environment like Hogwarts, mm. where it's the base camp of magic, yeah. we're in the place where it has to be hidden. I want you to have this, Credence. I would trust very few with it. Very few. But you... You're different. As with Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling has put the battle between good and evil at the center of Fantastic Beasts, and the oddball Credence plays a crucial role. My character, he goes around and he leaflets in the streets, uh, handing out flyers about stamping out abnormality. Meanwhile, he's abnormal. And when you find the child, you touch the symbol and I will know and I will come to you. Do this and you will be honored among wizards forever. Fantastic Beasts has, it feels to me, what I know of it, a slightly more grown-up Harry Potter. Is mm. that kind of how you see it? What's so beautiful about the material is that it matured with us, became more and more complex, more and more morally ambiguous. And now it kind of just feels like J.K. Rowling is bringing us that next step further. 
I mean, it is such a rich, magical world that she's created here, isn't it? Yeah. I think that's why we're so intrigued by, by the books and by the films. Yeah. Because it's that kind of, yes, there could be something more to all Absolutely. of this. Absolutely. Yesterday, a wizard entered New York with a case. This case full of magical creatures, and unfortunately, some have escaped. He arrived yesterday. You've known for 24 hours that an unregistered wizard set magical beasts loose in New York, and you see fit to tell us only when a man has been killed? Who's been killed? I've been given permission to go on set as Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is being filmed, but they've asked us not to make any noise. Lead actress Catherine Waterston is doing a short pickup shot with director David Yates, who I worked with on the last four Potter films. It's often more difficult when you're an actor having to kind of pick up these smaller moments than it is to play a whole scene because you've got to, you've got to get into the emotion and the mood of it just for a very short segment. Um, nice and quiet, please. So it can be quite tricky. Um, and action. David's warned me that it may not look very exciting now, but it's part of a crucial longer scene. And if you stick with me, we'll get to see it later. Very good, lovely. And if you can keep that pace going up the, that latter part would be lovely. Just because you're still on camera. And action. That just shows how much detail and how much time they take on something that will go by on screen in a matter of a few seconds. OK, good. And um, reset. Good. Much better, mate. Thank you. And, and obviously people like Catherine there get exhausted from going up and downstairs to however many times she just did that. I don't yeah, know. I was worried about you doing know, too much. Rhythm, no, that's with lovely, mate. Catherine's character, Porpentina Goldstein, brings Newt and his suitcase before Makusa. What did you know of the world of Harry Potter before you embarked on this project? I have pretty good knowledge of it. J.K. Rowling has really created a world, and you do get that feeling as you read more of them or watch more of the films that there's just kind of no limit to it. And that's what's so much fun about doing this, is that you just kind of get more of her incredible imagination. If you ask her a question, she has an explanation for it that's like, you know, 10 minutes long. The trouble with Tina as a character is she's, she's kind of brittle, kind of uptight, but you've got to love her as well. And that's not easy. I know, because I know the character so well, how much insecurity lies beneath and how much vulnerability lies beneath. Anyway, Catherine just nailed it in her audition. And action. Behind the magic in the new film, J.K. Rowling once again explores the importance of friendship. As the nomads Jacob, Newt, Tina and her witch sister Queenie come together following the escape of the beasts. This time, instead of having a trio, I've got a foursome. Queenie is a sweetheart who is in many ways the glue of the group. You prefer Pius Studo? I really don't have a preference. Newt simply wants to get his creatures back in that case and get out of there. Then you've got Jacob who increasingly is fascinated by what's happening and wants to stick with them. What are your thoughts on magic? Would you like to think that there's a little bit of magic in our world? It's not that far away. I think most people feel that there's more to our world than we understand. It seems like it's more fun to believe in magic than to not believe in magic. So then I suppose, yeah, I believe in magic. Well, sit down, Mr. Scamander. 
I'm not going to poison you. The popularity of J.K. Rowling's stories has, over the past 20 years, become a worldwide cultural phenomenon, which now extends beyond books and movies to the making of Harry Potter Studio Tour in Leavesden and to theme parks in Florida, Japan and now Los Angeles, which is where I've been summoned next. It's several years now since I played the Goblin Grip Hook in the final Harry Potter film. I said I'd get you in. I didn't say anything about getting you out. But globally, J.K. Rowling's stories are as popular as ever. And I've been invited to help open the new wizarding world of Harry Potter at Universal Studios Hollywood. It includes a wintry Hogsmeade, magical shops, and looming above, a massive replica of Hogwarts Castle itself. Wow. Your journey is about to start, but safely you must go. And so the Hogwarts sorting hat tells all you need to know. These benches are not safe for you if you are still too small. You must be more than goblin-sized. 48 inches tall. Before the crowds come in, I've been allowed a sneak preview of this new wizarding world, which took five years to create. In association with Universal Creative, everything here has been reproduced in minute detail by the same team who worked on the Potter movies, Stuart Craig, who I met earlier, and art director Alan Gilmore, who I've arranged to meet in the headmaster's study. Hello, Alan. Hey, Warwick. Welcome to Dumbledore's office in Hogwarts Castle. Thank you very much. Yes, here we are. Uh, right atop Hogwarts, at the very, very top, actually, in the, the Triple Tower. You both realize, of course, that in the past few hours, you have broken perhaps a dozen school rules. Yes, sir. And there is sufficient evidence to have you both expelled. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So J.K. Rowling entrusted you and Stuart with, with sort of creating her, her vision, I suppose, in, she, she in three did, dimensions. Yeah. The drawings that created this room we're in right now are the same ones from the film set. It's her directive that we do create a world that it is the same as the books and the films. There's a real logic behind everything we do here. Every detail actually comes from a real place. Like, this chair is gothic, so people, even though they know it's new, they, they accept it has been here for a long, long time. You totally nailed that. It does feel like an authentically old place. So I've been granted very special access to be up here. Can I explore? I mean, are these absolutely. stairs real here? They're real, absolutely. I can yeah, go can up explore. these stairs. Yep.
This is an angle nobody will see this from. But, you know, everything, the curtains, the books. The How many books the are there? It's all here. There's thousands of books. Thousands of books. Ah. Oh. The illusion. <laughs> and now for some work. The Wizarding World of Harry Potter here in Hollywood officially opens tomorrow, but I'm hitting the red carpet early for a special press event. I love being back in the Wizarding World, you know, having worked on the films for 11 years. I kind of miss it. <laughs> I've been working on this British accent. Can you rate my accent? How is it? Uh, it's not bad. Say cup of tea. <laughs> Say cup of tea. Cup of tea? Yes, it's very good. <laughs> oh, for me, it's always Wingardium Leviosa. But it is a useful thing to be able to levitate. For me, it would be useful. You know, because I'm three foot six and it's hard to reach cash machines and stuff. So just a few inches off the ground would just be perfect. I still don't think I've put my finger on what JK Rowling's done here. Is it that idea that we all like to believe there is a little bit of magic just beyond our reach? We all like to believe in that. Is that what she's tapped into here? Something very kind of deep within our psyche, I suppose. While I've been enjoying the VIP treatment, outside, thousands of ordinary fans have been queuing all night to be the first muggles through the gates of this new wizarding world in the heart of Hollywood. I'm asked a lot what the secret is. Why do people like the Wizarding World so much? And to an extent, I feel I'm the wrong person to answer it. And perhaps the only people who can really answer that question are the fans. And there's certainly enough of them here. You really feel like it's real. Like you finish reading the book, you feel like in your own life. Oh yeah, you feel like it's, it could really happen. If I wanted to be you know, as successful as J.K. Rowling, what would I have to do to create something like this? Believe in yourself and know that <laughs> what you have to say is important. You know, for all the kids that want that magic, want that, you know, ability to just churn a wand and change something, it's really great. And why do you think you love it so much? It's just, like, really relatable, even though it's, like, fantasy. I just feel like I, it makes me feel more powerful. Oh, well, thank you very much. You can have that photo now. Well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> You know, I've talked to a few people here. They all said similar things. They feel like they can do anything after reading the book or seeing the movie. People feel empowered. That is the gift that J.K. Rowling's given people. Yeah, it's, it's pretty astonishing and hugely powerful. I'm back in London to meet Fantastic Beasts director David Yates, who's agreed to give me an exclusive early peek at the scene we saw him working on at the studios. So David, thank you for inviting me to come here. You're in the middle of post-production for Fantastic Beasts at this point, so yeah, very busy time for you. Yeah. Now, when I came onto set, I was lucky to see you at work. What was going on in that scene? Catherine, who plays this lovely character called Tina, has been given the slip by Newt Scamander. Jacob has mistakenly picked up the suitcase and opened it. Newt runs up the stairs, opens the door, and to his horror, things were a lot worse than he anticipated. So she's running up these stairs trying to find him. And so Newt is racing to get the room back together in time. She needed to explore it, and I needed to sort of explore it. Mm. So she ran up the stairs about 20 times, <laughs> yeah. basically. Um, and that's what we ended up with in the movie. Henry, take it away. Oh. 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 Commander. It was open? 
just a smidge. That's yeah. brilliant. Wonderful to have a <laughs> wand, I tell you. Absolutely, yeah. very useful, yeah. As director of the last four Harry Potter movies, and now Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, Dave Yates has worked as closely as anyone with J.K. Rowling to help create the wizarding world. Why does J.K. Rowling's work resonate with so many people? What, what is the enduring appeal? I think she celebrates the fact that it's okay to be different. It's okay to be yourself. You should celebrate being who you are, however, however geeky, quirky, sort of how, whatever your self-perception is. It you you have a place in the world. Just around the corner in London's Theatreland, J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World is expanding into the future with a two-part, award-winning stage play, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. Set 19 years after the last Harry Potter novel, The Deathly Hallows, it tells the story of Harry's son, Albus. J.K. Rowling herself has asked that nobody speak about it if they've seen it, but I think it's all about people wanting to spend more time at Hogwarts and in that kind of magical world. Why did you buy a ticket and come all the way here to see this? It's Harry Potter. <laughs> this anything related to this world I want to be a part of. There's just so much to think about and it's so creative and yeah, like, it's so relatable. complex and relatable. Everybody has moments in their life where you do feel quite alone and it's seeing Harry and identifying with Harry that I think really resonates. We've all been there and I think that's yeah. also very relatable to show that we're not all perfect and we can't make mistakes and we can't overcome those mistakes. I'm here in New York, but before I go to the premiere of Fantastic Beasts and where to find them, I'm going to have a quick chat with the lady behind the magic, J.K. Rowling. Thanks so much for giving us the time to do this. I really appreciate it. I think it. I've figured out what it is that makes her wizarding world so popular, but there's still a couple of things I want to ask. <laughs> Here we are again. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Joe, you recently announced you're going to treat us to five fantastic beasts. I'm glad you say total. treat it. Indeed. We were delighted <laughs> to know that. And, That's good. Uh, it's very exciting. Now, can you hint at what parts of the wizarding world we're going to explore in those stories? Can you give us a hint? We're going to be exploring different parts of the magical world in a way that we've never done before. And I think it's, it's common knowledge now that um, Grindelwald and Dumbledore are both in this series. So it's, um, it's quite an ambitious story we're telling. Now, Newt as a character yeah. is a bit of an outsider. Completely. The same can be said of, of Harry as well. Yeah, I think I sort of set out my stall with the first sentence of the first Potter book. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley were proud to say they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. And that really set out a major theme in this whole world. What is normal? And what does that mean for those of us who do not conform to those norms? Which actually, when you start digging down, is a huge number of people. In the course of making this film, I've spoke to fans all over the world, and the one thing they say time and time again is that your characters, your stories, make them feel empowered, that they can do anything. Well, that's, an about these that's an amazing thing to hear. Mm. I think it took me um, decades of my life to realize that not only did I have to be me, that that was okay. Like, like a million other people, there's nothing particularly unique about this, but it's something that I feel quite strongly and I understand readers who feel that way, mm. who feel it's okay to be me and now I must find out what that means and how I can be the best me. Mm. Now from the character of Newt Scamander in Fantastic Beasts all the way through to Albus Potter yes. in uh, your hit London play, The Cursed Child, the Wizarding World spans a century and two continents. Yeah. Now you're famous for having the whole Wizarding World sort of mapped out in your head. Is that a process that continues? Is it forever expanding? Is it happening now, for example? It's not happening right now as we speak. So you're not thinking, I... you're not thinking about the further adventures of Professor Flitwick right now or, or Grip Hook, the troubled years, as I sit before you. I <laughs> wish I could say, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> if I just, do you know what? Wait, Warwick, something's <laughs> forming. Yes. Um, but is it somewhere that you, you often visit on your mind and, and, and add to? Do you know, it's, it, 
it's been with me for so long, 26 years. Mm. It's just there. I don't need to, you know, go into a trance to no. access. It's just there in my head. It will always be in my head. You can't spend that long working in that fictional world without it. Be I know it sounds terribly corny, but it becomes part of you. It just is. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you for your time, Jane. Thank you. I'm here at the world premiere of Fantastic Beasts and where to find them. I've had an amazing adventure into J.K. Rowling's Wizarding World and like the fans I've met along the way, I too feel her stories are empowering. And perhaps that's because there's a little outsider in all of us.